And as we did have a great discussion about the human element of that interaction, another thing that we have to keep in mind as educators is making sure that we are show, leading by example, but really showing our students how to be good digital citizens. So my next question, and we'll go ahead and start with Jin Laoshi. And the question is, how do you in, engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? I think it's a huge challenge. <laughs> and um, what I want to say is that um, I know in my school, uh, this online, uh, you know, digital citizenship has been the topic among all subjects. And uh, we do have um, uh, like special, like we call that uh, advisory. So we, you know, the whole school uh, actually sat down together to spend some time talking with the students. You know, uh, what a good digital citizenship looks like. Uh, what are the do's and don'ts? But I think for me, I, as, as a lot of uh, teachers here, I think we used to uh, struggle with Google Translate. And now these days is chat GPT, right? Um, this is the conversation I have um, day one, you know, uh, when school start, a new school year starts. And I told my students this, um, I don't mind if you use Google Translate or ChatGPT as a dictionary. If you need one word, you know, to express yourself well, you, you need that word, feel free to do so. But keep in mind what you present to me, you turn in as your, your work. I take that's yours. Use, uh, using Google Translate, um, and or ChatGPT should be a learning opportunity for you to expand your vocab, you know, to um, get your, it's like a self-led learning. I really want to use that word to express myself. Um, it did happen to me a couple of times. Students turned in a, a piece of writing. I know it's beyond them. <laughs> so I usually just, you know, call them to me, ask them, are you able to, explain to me what you just, you know, turning in, in this work. Uh, if they were not able to do it, I just asked them, why can you tell me, you know, this is your work, but now you won't be able to explain. Can you tell me why? It's either, you know, my mom helped me to write it because we have some heritage learners, in, you know, in, in my school. Or, oh, I just used um, Google Translate to translate the words. And then we, we had a conversation. You know, um, this is not the way to to learn. And also, I think another thing I did was, uh, I think one day we did a translation. I know it sounds weird, but we did. We did a paragraph translation. And and then I use actually I use uh, Chat GPT to translate the same um, passage, and I projected. On, uh, on the projector and ask my students, are you able to understand what it says here? They actually didn't recognize this was the same you know, uh, message. They did uh, translation themselves. And I was like, okay, can you see that here are some higher level words which you haven't learned yet, but can you guess you know, what they are based on the context, the words before, um, this specific word and the words after that, can you, you know, uh, figure out what that is? And at the end, I told them what happened. This is the same passage. It's just, I use Google uh, chat GPT to translate. But I told my students, keep those new words in mind. Those actually, those are the, the meaning of those words you guys know already. It's just now you will actually, this is an opportunity to learn a higher level word and if you want to move up in the uh, proficiency letter you need to start to build more words you know higher level um academic words so again um when they do um 
projects, usually I ask them to uh, cite a source. This is where I found, and you know, um, but I want to say, I know uh, I'm, I'm, I work in the Silicon Valley. I mean, my school is in the Silicon Valley. My kids, they can, they, they even told me, if you need your, your personal uh, learning management system, we can do the coding for you very quickly. They, I mean, I, I think I hate to, um, it's, like a, it's like a chasing game. You know, like new technology tools keep popping up and we have to chasing after the students. I hate that, but I really want my students to understand. This is for the, this is a learning, learning opportunity. And um, it's a challenge for the teachers as well. For the students, they want to learn something that can really challenge their mind. They want to learn something that is like, they, they, haven't, they haven't learned yet. So I, I always like to say this, I'm hoping my classroom, of course I'm teaching Zhuozi, which is desk, or pen, this is B. For high school kids, they know this is a pen. They just don't know how to say it in another language. But of course, I want to teach them how to say it in you know, another language. But at the same time, I want to teach them something or present some information they have not seen, what they have not learned from other classroom yet. Their English teachers haven't talked about it. Their social studies teachers haven't talked about that. It's, it's a challenge, but it's also fun. I remember those moments when I presented, you know, some interesting information to them. I can see their eyes it's like shining and I see stars in their eyes. A, a very um, a example came into my mind is I teach my Chinese one, you know, school supplies, you know, bi, shu bao, all of those, right? And a Chinese teacher actually shared with me uh, in Africa, uh, a, a Chinese company is selling solar backpacks in Africa. So when kids go to school, they actually collect solar energy because you know on the backpack, there were solar uh, panels to collect uh, energy, right? When they go home, some kids don't have electricity at home in, at night. They can use that to do their homework. So it's a simple backpack can actually have a lot of story to talk about. Those are the things I think I want to really share with my students. Am I off topic? I'm sorry. <laughs> not at all, not at all. And it, there is, there, there's definitely a challenge. I can certainly relate. We want to stay on top of the latest technologies and the latest trends, but when we can find the new things, the real world connections that bring in things that our students are really interested in, they care about and connect it to their Mandarin Chinese. That's really when the learning occurs and that you can definitely see in how they engage, even the online environment. I can tell when it's a topic they're really interested in. If we're talking about say popular music and they're writing paragraphs about their favorite musicians and, and it, it's just fun to see that interaction. So thank you. I agree. That's a great way to build those digital, the, uh, the uh, digital citizenship rather. Thank you. Uh, Kas Laoshi, same question to you, and this is again about digital citizenship. How do you engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? Sure, that's a good question, and I'm really glad Jin Lao brought up Google Translate and ChatGPT because I think these are things. I think the ChatGPT scare, if we want to call it that, in our field is very similar to the Google Translate scare of five or five or 10 years ago, where sort of everybody, when it first came out, was freaking out and worried that, you know, it's going to replace language teaching and it's going to, students are going to cheat and all of these things. And I want to go back to something that, that Terry said earlier, which is assume, you know, assume the best, right? So I think the first thing that is important is that we don't go into misuse of digital tools with the assumption that our students are bad, evil, doing it intentionally, doing it to spite us, all of these sort of negative deficit kind of mindset perceptions that we have of students, you know, and we don't, and we don't go into the conversation, why are you cheating all these things, right? I think it, it if we're talking about those kinds of tools specifically, it really is important to have some conversations with some different people about what they are and what they're not, what they can be used for, what they can't be used for, what expectations are, and I will be the first one to tell you, you know, 
cheating is always about grades and never about learning. So if you think about it like that, someone using something like ChatGPT or Google Translate to get a grade is because you gave them an assignment and it's holding, it's being held over their heads. And for whatever reason, because of language ability or because they're too busy, they're overworked, underslept, who knows why, they want to still get the grade and they take a shortcut to get the grade, but that's not about learning. It, it, it's not about learning from the student's perspective. They know that they're not learning and it's certainly not gonna result in all that much learning. So I think those conversations are important to have with students and respect that they are autonomous, you know, adolescents or college students, people love to call college students adults. Mm, they're legally adults, but they're high school kids plus a summer break, they're not adults. Um, and to help them think through some of these things, because they're being overwhelmed with just as much information as we are, and they don't, they have no reason to think about responsible use of tools if that thinking and conversation is not being modeled and being explicitly done with them, not just around them. So I think having conversations with students is really important, but I think having those conversations on your teaching team, on your, in your building, sort of what is your school culture around the use of things like online tools in general resources, something like ChatGPT. It's also important to have conversations with parents because if my mom doesn't understand how language acquisition works and she's like, well, I don't know how to help you with your homework. Why don't you use Google Translate? That's not always coming from a bad place. That's coming from a, I'm mom and I don't speak Chinese, so I don't know how to help you. And I know that this thing exists, so maybe that can help you. And I don't know that that might do more harm than good in terms of your actual language development. So I think for the first half of my answer, the piece that's really important is those really clear conversations around expectations and what the tool is and what it's not and what it, what you as a community of learners and teachers are okay with and what what where the lines are, where the boundaries are and why those boundaries are there and what happens when the boundary is crossed, right? If we're a community and we agree that we're here to learn Chinese and interact and benefit from this and support one another, then when someone isn't, you know, holding up that community norm that we decided together is important, what are we going to do about it? What, what do we as a group believe is the best course of action? And then for, I, I love something that Dean also just said, and I think this is something that language classes actually do really, really nicely sometimes, which is that in addition to sort of giving you new ways to say the same things that you already know, we're sort of, we do have opportunities because we're going to ask you to do things like make presentations or do some kind of project or, or look information up, leverage your multilingual resources, go interview somebody, whatever. I think we do have lots of opportunities to help students with things as simple as like, if you're going to make a PowerPoint, link the sources. And that's a very simple thing, but it's something that maybe no one ever told them in their academic life yet. And that's a part of dig digital citizenship. It's if you're going to go cite sources, learning maybe a little bit about reliability of online information and how there's lots of information online doesn't mean it's all good. Um, I think because we're interacting so much as a community, especially in an online space, we can talk a little bit about what it means to be kind in online interaction. And that's that's a part of digital citizenship also. And then one, honestly, I think maybe this is, Jen also called it the Zoom year, you know, in the in, in that year, something that I did, I taught every, every level of classes I was teaching that year had a unit that was something along the lines of health and wellness or whatever. And we kind of shifted it topically to be a little more about mental well-being, because that year in particular was challenging for, for college students living at home or not at home. Um, one thing that I on, that I assigned students a couple times was just to like get off your screens. Like your assignment tonight is to leave your house, go do something outside, and then come ready to share what you did tomorrow in class. And something that I learned as I was thinking a little more about digital citizenship for this panel is part of digital citizenship is balancing being in a digital space and being not. And I thought, wow, what a cool thing that we can be modeling, which is a thing that I think we're probably all guilty of is that we sit on our technology too much and that as good as it is for all kinds of reasons for connection and communication and things even sometimes helping our high school and younger and older students self-regulate a little bit around like how much am I actually spending time on my phone teaching them that they can click a button on an iPhone and find like that screen time report 
and have them go, whoa, I spent 14 hours a day on my phone last week. That's a scary number. How do I feel about that? And what do I want to do differently next week, right? Those are things you can do really easily in another language that have meaningful sort of impact. And then you'll get students who come back and say, you know, I cite my sources in other classes now too. And I look at them and go, wow, you're 22. I, I, I wish you had done that before this year, but I'm glad you learned how to do that in a Chinese class. That's a cool thing that in addition to some language that you're getting in terms of sort of these life skills. So yeah, lots of, lots of cool things to think about there. Fantastic. And I love how you talked about leading by example and us sort of taking a step back and saying, well, you know, we as a group came together at the consensus that these are the norms that we're going to abide by. Now, as an educator, I need to do that too. And I need to show my students, I need to lead by example. It's very important in digital citizenship. Thank you for that. Uh, Waltz Lao Chi, same question. And again, this is about digital citizenship. How do you engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? Well, I think as our other two panelists pointed out, a lot of the digital citizenship issues come from some of the newer technologies like ChatGPT and Google Translate, which is new compared to when we in the dark ages were you know, learning from paper books and stuff. But um, I think that that in large part flows from what we're asking students to do and how we've prepared them to do it or failed to prepare them to do it. The key to getting students not to rely on mechanical translation is to make it faster and easier to just do the translation themselves. And that means they need to have acquired language in their brains ready to use. And that in turn means, this is like the, not the five whys, but like the five and so then things. But so then we have to think about, um, are we making assignments to be done when they're not under our eyes? Because that's when that happens generally. Are we making assignments that are take home or do outside the classroom or asynchronously or whatever that are really within the bounds of what they can reasonably be expected to do at this point of their Mandarin careers or not. There, and there's a difference with that. Their understanding hopefully is always going to be ahead of their productive ability, right? So whenever I can, I'm gonna give assignments that are receptive assignments, listening or reading rather than production. Okay, because number one, that eliminates that problem. But number two, I know that if they are getting comprehended language from those activities coming in, right, hopefully even from native speakers who get their tones better than I did, don't be writing to me about that video now, um, then that's going to benefit them. And it's going to go directly toward their pool of language and it's going to be correct. On the other hand, if I have students who are go off and they're given a topic they're not familiar with, and I'm talking about students at first, second, maybe third year, maybe not talking about AP. I'm not talking about students who have already acquired all the major structure of the language firmly and correctly. But before that, we get a lot of students going off and they do their best, but they're, they have to fall back on their native language if they're not using a tool. And it gets so convoluted and so difficult for them that they go for the tool. That makes sense just makes sense. So I think that we only have, you know, in a typical high school class, we have 108 hours a year. And that's before we take away assemblies, music lessons, field trips, bomb scares, school shootings, whatever it is. You know, these days, there's a bigger and bigger list of things that nibble away at our instructional time. We have to think about the assignments that we give as carefully as we think about what we're doing in the classroom. And really, the big thing that I've learned, and uh, I liked uh, Galausha mentioning this, is that I totally agree. The less I teach, the more they comprehend and the more proficient they become, because I want to teach narrow and deep. Okay, so I'm concentrating on getting my students to acquire the structure of the language. How does the language work? They don't need to know 5,000 characters to do that. They need to know a subset of the vocabulary of Chinese. And I'm gonna pick that to be 
the highest frequency words, which they will hear the most, and the words that are specific to their lives. When I taught in Hawaii, I taught the word surfing because everybody surfed. But here in New York, I don't teach surfing anymore because, except if, if it's for fun. You know, very different reactions. So I'm going to want to make the best use of that and not teach nearly as much. I'd even go beyond the 20%. Now, I am lucky that I teach for myself now and I don't have to cover a certain amount. But when I used to have to do that, I would simply triage the textbook. I would go through the textbook with an Excel spreadsheet and write all the vocabulary words in the left column. And then in the next column, I would write, yes, that's really important. Two for, eh, yeah, it's a, if I get to it, that would be good. And three for, who thought that was a good idea for a second year textbook? Because, you know, even as a fluent speaker, I was looking up a lot of those words. I didn't know what they were necessarily. You know, oh my God, teachers are, you know, admitting they don't know everything. Not even close, you know, especially as a non-native speaker, forget it. So I think that's the big things to look at. The other thing that helps, I think, is designing the audience for them. I like to say to my students, if you're going to write this thing, write it so that your classmates can read it. So it encourages them to stay to the pool of language that they have. If I have those future language teachers of America who are super, super fast, or, or maybe their heritage or something, I'm going to give them a different assignment. I'm not going to give them the same assignment. So that, because it's very hard for native speakers or, or more proficient people to write in that little narrow fence that students can understand at a certain point, of course. But anyway, those would be my suggestions to help them design their audience and to make it easier to do the work themselves than to do it in some other way, you know. And I like that you talked about the need for differentiated instruction. And I can certainly imagine if I were coming from a background of a heritage speaker, if I were constrained to a small pool, I could imagine that would be really stressful for me. It might cause me to shut down a little bit, but I like that we're in the online environment, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, we're able to do that. We're able to provide that differentiated instruction. Thank you very much for that. 